Welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. Thank you for coming by to listen. Today's show is a real treat. If you're at all into like spirituality or consciousness, this is the show for you, or even just like how to live your life to achieve your highest timeline. The guest today is Sarah Alcaldi. She's a mystic spiritual teacher and author. She goes by The Alchemist on Instagram and YouTube, and she has incredible content on the nature of this reality and how the universal laws play into our experience. We just unpacked what reality is, timelines, dimensions, a duality, purpose, dharma. Uh, these are all uh, big topics that we dive into. And it was just such a, like a fluid conversation. We just kind of kept navigating and weaving through all of these very interesting topics. Oh yeah, plant medicine. That was one of them that came up at the very beginning and the role that that plays the danger that can be within it, but also what it can show you. I loved it. Like these are like my jam. These episodes are just, I just feast on them because people that have had experiences and gained knowledge in the areas of reality that are more hidden or occult, uh, I just want to pick their brain. So that's what I did today. Enjoy, uh, please hit subscribe. I really appreciate that. Grateful for you loving this channel, listening to this channel. The bell is for notifications when we have episodes come out. And uh, gosh, let me know some of your stories in the comments. I'd love to hear if you've had mystical experiences or um, what you think about uh, the episode. Me and technology is just, I don't know, it doesn't compute. Is there some like universal reason why like someone like me who loves spirituality and like mystery schools and ancient like is there some like reason why technology doesn't agree with me i just want an excuse is basically what i'm looking for yeah because i wanted an excuse so i found one <laughs> yes because i see all these esoteric bros who like love math and i'm like oh yeah <laughs> and like, I suck at math, no matter how hard. And I use that and I lump that in with technology. And here's why we're not good with that. We came in to kind of section off that part so we could do what we need to do. And that stuff would like interfere with it. <laughs> yes, that makes perfect sense. And also, like, here's another weird thing. I don't know if you get this, but I'm really good at guessing numbers. Like I can guess distances, time, weights, heights. Like I can guess things in when it comes to numbers, but when it comes to actually like the math of it and like the logical side, I, I don't, it's 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 not a part of me. So I think maybe it's <clears throat> strong intuition and strong sort of psychic capabilities, mm -hmm. but totally weak logical mathematical capabilities. I completely agree. I've actually forgotten, like it's left my memory, like half of the stuff I learned to even get me to where I am today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, another one that's weird too is names. I'm just like, names are not my thing either. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think about it from more of a spiritual perspective and think how names are just they're not necessarily that meaningful. They just help us sort of identify and like uh, make communication a little bit easier. Like, oh, I was talking to Sarah um, instead of having to go into the girl who has long, dark hair and whatever else. Um, and so I think like names just aren't actually that important. I completely agree. As soon as somebody tells me their name, it leaves. And so I started to assess that. And I was like, am I like a narcissist? Like, do I not remember people's names? And I was like, no, I just know, like, it, I carry the information through very similar means as you and names is very irrelevant to that. Explain your process when you meet someone. What are you assessing? What are you picking up? And what are you trying to figure out? <laughs> That last part's exactly true. What I'm trying to figure out is where they're dialed into. Not because I'm going to go match them, but also to be appropriate. <laughs> and so a lot of my journey has even been just making sure that there is a connecting factor, mm -hmm. a, a very relatable factor. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I do when I'm like dialing in. God, I, I like, I feel like I am, like, you're my sister already because that's when I meet people. It took me a long time, but I realized that I was waiting to see if they're, I didn't know this, but I was waiting to see if the what they were portraying matched with their energy. 
and seeing how sort of accurate and truthful it was. And then of, of course, like assessing where I go next. Do I want to talk to him even? Or do I, you know, where do I, where do I go with this situation? Do I move to another person? What do I ask them? Do I put them on the spot? I'm I'm an Aries, so I can be a little fiery. So sometimes I just like to like prove a point. Um and so or call them out. Um, so I, I realized that about myself too. I'm just like trying to match up the situation and but I'm seeing if their energy matches their words, basically. Yeah. And also I'm assessing like I really like to catalyze people. Mm. So a lot of the time what I'm actually doing is just looking for where I can help them develop. Do they have to ask for help? Well, that's a funny thing because if somebody starts talking to me at a party, for instance, then that mm -hmm. was them asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Literally, hello is an ask. <laughs> yeah. If someone's following me on social media, if somebody came into my sphere in any way, then that's me saying, oh, okay, the universe. I've even had conversations that are like super far out there at a restaurant and you know the people who I'm talking to might not be as comfortable simply because of the environment we're in and I'm like anyone who's at a corner who overheard anything that they were supposed to I I normally don't go too much into origin but I don't I, I don't know exactly where your spirituality or where your awareness and your knowing came from or or when or if you if you learned it or if you somehow an experience you had um helped you remember uh I can binge on your episodes on YouTube pretty deeply because it's so clear and so so confident and clear and tangible so how did that all how did that all arrive for you so what happened was i came in with a strong knowing but like everyone else you just get gaslit mm -hmm. into the program right and then my catalyst had nothing vaguely had to do with spirituality i didn't even know that my path was unraveling into a highly spiritual path it was more so just i was very much in activism like very, I know for my channel, I'm talking a lot about like super metaphysical concepts and everything from like the highest plane of consciousness that I can access. But it started from literally like me going to protest a lot, me being very angry, me working through a lot of catharsis with everyday injustice hmm. and, and pulling on that, unraveling that because I like to use health as an example because mm -hmm. that's how I even became curious about anything. I was interested in health. I used to be a personal trainer. Mm. And I noticed that a lot of different people, whether they're sick and that's how they get into spiritual awakenings or one way or another, it has to do with health. Because once you start questioning, hey, why is this in my food? Or, hey, did you know that this is in my drinks and stuff? Once you pull on those threads, if you pull on those threads, they unravel very fast and they go like, it's like whoa, whoa, whoa what the heck are GMOs, you know? And so for a long time, I was really in what I would call like the bare bones of what later was, I understand the preparation, hmm. of, you know, higher revelations of, of a path that was unfolding. But yeah, so I came into things, I wouldn't say super mystical, but yet I was always drawn to esoterica, always. And so I started kind of going back and forth in between things that like very much every day mattered to our world. And yet at the same time, things that were so mystical, <laughs> so cryptic that it took a lot of studying and research and going back and forth with forums that I was interactive with at the time. Mm -hmm. So I came from what, what you could call mystery school forums. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, hermetics. Mm -hmm. Hermetic initiations. And then I don't know if you're familiar with the fourth way, your death. Yeah. So there's just a lot of different mystical information that I was exposed to. On your own? Or, were, or was it just sort of like coming into your reality through someone you trained or a friend? Or were you seeking it out and you kind of like resonated with it? I'd say both because the more that I was seeking it out mm -hmm. and, you know, like being a part of like groups. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> very much mirror to you anything that you can find wrong like <laughs> which which I try not I, I try my best to take what really helped me and be kinder to people than my own path mm -hmm. at the same time mm. 
that doesn't always translate just because I came, straight up came from mysticism. So what I'm learning as a spiritual teacher, and even with my channel, you might see this is I, I'm learning how to be nicer in my deliveries mm -hmm. because I came from no chill. We don't have like, you need to say this a certain way. You need to prepare me a certain way. You need to be nicer. You need to be this or that. So for me, I'm almost like what I consider public relations. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how do I take my journey, my knowledge, knowledge base, my gnosis, and then create a bridge from it so that I'm able to make the make consciousness cool, make yeah. it understandable, make exactly. you know, like, mm. yeah. But at the same time, I got that bite because I came from mysticism and there's no you don't dilute things. You you so don't by saying I came from mysticism, you're saying that that's where your teachings came from was like mystery school teachings was groups that were engaging in that kind of um, information or ritual. You're saying that's your sort of background to this information is mysticism. Yes, but I still wouldn't have called all of that gnosis. Gnosis mm -hmm. is meaning that it's fully digested. It's fully metabolized. It's a part of you. What, when I developed that gnosis, it was actually through mystical medicine experiences. I got blown open. My, my emergence into enlightenment was not at all what I was expecting. Well, good. I'm glad you're telling this story because the next question I was going to ask was, did you have some kind of initiation? Yes. Please tell if you're willing. Yeah. So a part of what I feel my purpose is here is to really help awaken the world into God consciousness mm -hmm. or oneness. And what I was specifically shown literally through every part of my energy field, very much so the physical body. Source, if, if source gave you all of source's information in your physical body, you'd blow up. There's yeah. no, you can't, you can't store that much information in your capacity. Yep. I was given as much as that as would not kill me. Yep. And yes. and nothing less. So mm. because of that, <laughs> I you're like to, nothing less. I about <laughs> short circuited. Yeah. I short circuited. I literally short circuited my meridians. And so uh, after that I was like in this weird wonky land which um, I understand now is actually initiations um, after enlightenment, because a lot of times people think enlightenment is this like end deal. And it's not. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, enlightenment can even be looked at as a springboard. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, you understand we're all one. <laughs> There's, you know, like it's to, for people who are truly enlightened, put it this way. It's not that big of a deal. It's kind of like, it's the standard. It's like define, a define, of, can you define enlightenment then? Yeah. Enlightenment is to understand that you are the other person and the other person is you. You're different expressions of source. Mm -hmm. So you are the all, but you are also an ambassador of the all of mm -hmm. the all. So I'm, you know, we were talking about names earlier. I'm Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, after enlightenment, I had to go, I'm Sarah. How funny. <laughs> You're like this, this, this fractal of source is called Sarah. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'm, you know, like I'm a human. I'm playing human yeah. right now. Right. <laughs> so yeah, there was a, a deep integration. I'm talking years and mm. it could have, it could have integrated better. It could have integrated stronger had there been like more just baseline nutrition <laughs> support, like physical things going on. But yeah, that's one of the things I, I tell a lot to my clients or I, I, when I'm at my events and I speak to people about when they have questions, a lot of the times I try to bring them back into like, hey, how are you caring for the physical body? Because it's going through a lot right now. Mm, yeah. It's not just a metaphysical awakening that's happening. Like the body needs to be supported through this or else it can't even house that much information mm. in a congruent and clear way. I'm I'm curious and you can feel free to answer whatever is comfortable for you. But, you know, I talk about it fairly regularly on the show about, and I ask a lot of questions about plant medicine. And I feel like that's 
I think that's what you alluded to. Yeah. So I, I'm curious what it was, um, if you're, if you're share, if you're willing to share, but I've found that, you know, there's gateways to other realities in a sober sense. And you can do that through, I mean, shoot, I had a transcendental experience with a dog on the beach in Mexico, but, um, you can do that through meditation and various different things, or you can kind of like, kind of more guarantee the door with some plant medicines, or at least like make it highly probable. I still think that you, when your guard is up and you're, and you're not able to surrender, it still makes those, those portals and those gateways to other realities still very difficult to access. Um, but I've found so much, what feels like very occult information within them. Um, and truly my deepest question is uh, in life is what is this reality? Cause when I know, understand what this reality is, I know how to play the game tell me more if you're willing, like what kind of ceremony was it? And, you know, there's also so much, so much around ceremony right now or about plant medicines with psilocybin and ayahuasca and peyote and various different, um, various different uh, medicines that I think people need to know the, 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 the gravity of them. And, um, you know, if that was something that interested in them, it's good to know the right way to go about it too. Yeah. So one thing that made me a perfect match to the ceremony being a way for source to kind of like touch me, if you will, mm -hmm. was the fact that I have a very broad bandwidth, meaning that, for instance, just one example is in esotericism, Lucifer, for instance, isn't such a bad guy. He's like a frenzied force. He comes with divine revelation. He's revered. Mm. There's also a downside, obviously, but that's like more carnalism, more hedonism. Mm. The way that this character is portrayed in the exoteric realm in the mainstream is completely off base. It's linked with the devil or Satan and all these things. No, Luciferian energy is one that needs to be harnessed. You have to make sure that you can harness it. But it's one that definitely is so revered in esotericism because it's all about gnosis. So that one example of the fact that I have very little fear around concepts where most people have a lot of blocks and fears mm -hmm. is just one small example. I could go on and on, but really of the fact that the more we're able to understand complexity and the more we're able to hold nuance and really like worlds at the same time, we're able to be for lack of a better term, more useful when we're in ceremony or when we're communing or whatever, because if we're looking for a true awakening, we're going to have to embody that, right? And that embodiment, there's a huge gap between the mental awakening and the embodiment awakening. Totally, totally. And so because of that, the embodiment awakening journey <laughs> looks like completely different than the mental awakening journey. So to answer your question, I was in ceremony at that time with psilocybin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had done that several times before. And the only thing I could think of that made that time particularly um, ripe is the fact that I was with two very high vibrating friends. So I kind of look at them as like antennas that I didn't know I was getting myself into. Mm hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it broke me. It was not even like it was nothing that I, it was nothing wild. It was no dose that like I really? was super like, oh, man, you're doing a hero's thing. It was just to me very standard. I went in with the intention to meet my ancestors, something that was pretty grounded for me at the time. I met my ancestors. All right. <laughs> so I lost my mind in this tent to the point where I had PTSD for months later where I'd wake up in the middle of the night and think I'm still in the tent. So it became like the tent for me, Oof. but it broke my mind. And I all of a sudden was processing all this information about source. I wrote poetry about it. Uh, I could not ground worth anything. And I kept mm. talking to the people who were in the tent with me as though they were on the same level of consciousness with me. So we were a group consciousness mm. and I kept looking at them and we were all, well, <laughs> I found out later, they didn't know that any of this was going on. <laughs> they just saw that I, you know, I left. Were you actually talking to them or were, was your perception that you were? I was talking to them. Okay. But everything that I said, they took it from their level of reality. But I thought that they were at my level of reality and they weren't. 
So I was processing source and source was showing me, look, this is not only who you are, this is what's going on. And I started getting a bunch of information about what's going on. And I'm like, and then I got a bunch of shame because of all the wars taking place on earth. And I was like, oh my God, because I'm God. I was like, I'm so much drama. <laughs> oh, I'm so much. And I got like complete shame for all of the conflict that I started. And then th it was telling me that like, you have to come here and do what you're going to do. Like you, ha you have to come speak and teach. And I told the other two, which I thought we were all on the same page. And we were, <laughs> I told them, why do I have to be the one to take form? And I was so mad and bitter. And I want, I didn't want to be the one to be in form. I, I wanted to be, I guess, at the time, one of them that relay information to the one who takes form. So I felt like I got the short stick, like we all drew. And I was like, and they didn't know, they were like, what, do you need to go to the bathroom? But for me, I was like, reconciling something at a higher plane of consciousness. So I was turning to them and I was like, I don't want to be the one to take form. And I just felt like the whole consciousness funneled in and said, Sarah will be your name. Like, does that make sense? What did reality seem like in that space? What was reality as you learned it? Yeah, I'd never, I had never seen it that way before. It was all etheric. It was all like, if I was looking at you right now, you would look like almost translucent. Everything looked completely translucent. And even source came in a, in a very like cliche, typical Bible-ish way. Uh -huh. Very translucent, light like. came from, <laughs> yeah. Have you ever seen the movie? I believe it's called The Nines with Ryan Reynolds. No. Okay. So after I had that experience later on, I saw the I'm going to watch it now, but. <laughs> yeah, I know you have to. And then I tripped out even more because that movie was about... I don't know if I should spoil it for you, but essentially it was very similar to my experience. And I was already trying to integrate my experience. So once I saw that, that to me was like, no, you cannot. When you integrate it, that does not mean you cannot pretend that this wasn't real. So once I saw that movie, I was like, oh no, this is my new level of reality. I have to play at this level of reality. So my enlightenment, and I say that with no ego, because like I said, enlightenment to me is not a big deal. And I know that there's a lot of... um taboo around that word. And I think that that taboo is there for a good reason. Mm. I can see <laughs> that's the problem. Now I can, I can see everyone's perception. <laughs> I can see why people have, you know, um, boundaries up against that word. And I think that those boundaries, for the most part, the overwhelming majority of the reason why we have an aversion to enlightenment is because of, you know, really toxic teachings that have been passed down throughout the ages that with, you know, like the typical guru type. Mm -hmm. However, enlightenment is, you know, if there were another name, I just use that name because to me, I don't care about the name. So I'm using the name enlightenment because we, we can all kind of like agree yeah. that when I'm saying that, that it's talking about a specific level of reality. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it just was years process of integrating that new level of reality. And now it's just, you know, I'm more grounded. Because I've done various different medicines and I did see a, I did a hero's dose not too long ago, five grams of psilocybin and it, it was a, uh, it's quite an experience, but, um, so I've, and, and, and I've done ayahuasca and, um, you know, done ceremonies. So some cool stuff has come through, but, or even my ex experience with the dog and this mystical experience and this being able to feel pure love and, and that whole story. Um, I look at it, like I go into the experience and my reality on the inside matches the outside. And then when these things happen, my reality on the inside no longer matches the outside. And that I always tell people if you're first off, like plant medicine has to call you, it's got to be your decision because number two, like it will change your life for sure. Like it just, there's just no getting around it and it's for the better, but it doesn't always feel like that for a while because a lot of things can change. Um, but what is that, pro what is happening within that? And if you agree, or maybe you can articulate it in a different way, but what is happening in those ceremonies or those those times when we have an experience that shows us something we've never seen before and changes our life? Like what is happening in that process? I look at it like jumping timelines, but I don't know if I'm articulating that right. There's always an energy exchange. Mm. So for any 
um, medicine a person takes, there's subconsciously an agreement that I'm going to have a fast track. I'm going to have an accelerated experience, one that would have taken me a long time to acquire. But because we're in the spirit of this age, it's fine. It really is. You you push the button and then, you, you know, like you, we have to um, not like it, not like in a very, you know, anxious way, but we're playing catch up to our spirit and our mm. spirits are very huge. Mm. So, but there's always an exchange. So what we're doing is going, okay, I need to get to here. This will get me here quicker for mm. whatever means that is for the person's journey. Where there might be an issue, however, is that the embodiment doesn't actually happen, the integration. So that's when people have a peak experience. And those peak experiences fade away after. I would not consider that enlightenment. People are having peak experiences. I don't care. I don't lose sleep at night over it. But people are having peak experiences and then going back to their level of consciousness. When you don't, when it's what you said, where you have that and it changes you. What's going on is not just a bunch of neuroplasticity, but think of your circuits or meridians in your body as like freeways of information. Mm -hmm. You're reconfiguring all of that so that you can hold more than you had the current capacity coming into this world with. So what's going on at that level is cellular reconfiguration because degeneration is when cells start um not communicating. So upgrades, you know, we love upgrades in the spiritual community. Yeah. yeah. Upgrades are when cellular communication strengthens mm. because you could look at that kind of like fiber optics, like you're, so what's going on is a reconfiguration to the meridians and to the cellular body in order to strengthen cellular communication. What could go wrong in those scenarios? Like we were talking, you know, you open up, you're opening up portals. Like what are the dangers of those experiences? Because I think those are real. And what do you do to protect yourself? Yeah, they're very real. I've known, you know, a lot of really permanently crazy stories. But, you know, as with anything, I've heard just as many, if not way more positive ones. Mm -hmm. The negative effects are that possession straight up possession when you're once again it's an energy exchange so mm -hmm. since it's an energy exchange you're going here like uh i'm an energy healer as well the energy field from what i've learned from shamans to alchemists there's certain substances that tear your field apart completely tear it apart and not in a positive like upgraded way like tear the field apart and so because of that when the field gets so distorted from certain substances, not only is what, how you're calling it portals, that's ripe for possession mm -hmm. and that's ripe for um, creating more fragmentation within the being. Mm. So our, our consciousness is like muscles. It tears and it grows back stronger. That's the point. But when it tears and it doesn't grow back stronger, it tears and it becomes more fragmented. So it's the opposite of the integration. That is the biggest danger with the medicines. Talk about the integration part of it then. The integration part of it is back to, I always say this, minerals. <laughs> like oh, physical really? body like, truly, support. Like your physical body. Yeah, physical body support. Like what's the difference between a great experience in me with medicines and a very horrible one? I don't know. How much vitamin C did you have? Does your body, like, think about it. How much, how much do we put our liver through? Just as one example, mm. how much do we put our adrenals through? Mm. If our vehicle is running on empty and then we go and we stimulate it, we like, we like really stimulate it. How are, are we setting the body up to like really be able to have a substantial <laughs> integrated, <laughs> you know, mystical experience? Oh, wow. So if the body like doesn't have enough vitamin C, just as one example. Mm -hmm. So the liver's like, okay, I was already taxed. And now I have to go process all of this new stimuli. It's not going to make or break. I don't want to make this sound like I, once again, I, I don't lose sleep over people having peak experiences and not integrating it. Mm -hmm. But it would help 
if people make sure that they have, you know, like sufficient nutrient levels. Mm -hmm. Is that where the diets came from to prepare for ceremonies? Like some people go straight into an IO ceremony and they just like do it. And then like my experience was having, you know, taking out animal animal meats for any animal products for at least a week to, you know, not a lot of fatty, fatty and salty and sugary foods, just like really getting bland, 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 bland all the way to ceremony. And then having just, you know, quite a specific diet before, um, is that where that comes from? Or is that more just ritual? That's ritual. Mm. So that would be my, my approach is more modern mm. and it's a mixed one because I I've studied under different holistic means. So how I'm looking at it is resources. Does the body have enough resources? What you're describing is great for attaining higher revelations. And that's what that diet is specifically meant for. So yeah, that's a great diet for, for the means, for the mystical. To be experience. able to get your body in a position to um, process the medicine in a stronger way. Yeah. Totally. Have not a lot of interference, keep reducing interference with the medicine. Absolutely. Because what you're doing is making sure that the vessel is in a, a detox or a, a, a more pure state. Yeah. So what's, that's what it's doing. It's it's um, detoxing the vessel. What's the point of these medicines? Were, were they put here for us to use or were are they just natural and we just think it's kind of interesting and it's so different? Like I, I'm just trying to understand like from a more from a more macro level, what are, what are they here for? Yeah. The, the medicines are here to help us remember when it's time to, I always say that I think that the whole world should just, whether they want to or not, you know, those like giant helicopters, just like DMT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, DMT when you're a baby and that's why you're this pure little thing. And then it and just that's, away. Yeah. That's my force quit. When I, when I get upset, I go, you know, just DMT them all. So, get them like, all enough. DMT vape pens, at least, at least. Yeah. So for me, I think that they're definitely a tool and that's why I'm okay with them being an energy exchange. I don't think this yeah. needs to be a huge arduous process because evolution on its own, if we were to leave evolution up to simply without help of these medicines would take a really long time. But we also have the energies within this age that are super supportive, regardless of whether we're taking medicines or not. The energies in this age are different than the energies in the age before and the age before. So the energies that we're swimming in right now are pretty much DMT anyways. Like they're, they're just super lucid. I've known people who have reached very similar states of consciousness as the one that I was explaining through like an MCT brownie. Yeah. And it's like, how is a weed brownie going to make you blow up? And it's not because of that. It has nothing like, like the MCT brownie is like the excuse. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. almost like the, so I tell people all the time, like, if you use the medicines, that's absolutely fine. I'd be a complete hypocrite to say, you know, don't use those. I don't use any anymore, mm -hmm. but that's because I got a lot on my plate to integrate. Mm -hmm. So I'm fine with that. I think they did their job. Um, drowning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I feel like even with or without them, the spirit of this age, it just really enhances what we already came in and our purpose in this lifetime. Yeah. Have you heard of the stoned ape theory? No, but I think it, I know what it is. It's basically that back in, you know, very ancient times where, you know, humans weren't humans, they were whatever homo, homo erectus or whatever phase humanity was in. But it was that they basically were eating like patty size hall uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms and it just ex expanded their mind and evolved humanity in, in a really accelerated way. Yeah, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. Where did alchemist come from? Like, why is that? Why was that the word you chose for, you know, presenting yourself? Where did, where did that come from? I wouldn't, you know, I used to just think when I was first learning about alchemy that it's just, you know, like the hermetic art, 
And the hermetic arts, there's um, four classical hermetic arts, but I just thought I have a way different perception of alchemy now. I think the cosmos is alchemy. Everything is alchemy because alchemy is also where chemistry derived from. Mm -hmm. You and me speaking exactly on this day, um, but yours and mine energy combined is a certain alchemy. And everything else, like getting a tattoo is alchemy because you everything goes in to yeah. the tattoo once you open the skin everything that what the stars were doing at that time the mood of the person who was making the tattoo everything so everything you could go to this you could visit the same country twice and you could have completely different experiences and it would be what was the context what context were you there the first time what context were you there the second time everything is alchemy because everything depends on us and so it's like we're never the same person nobody crosses the waters twice we're a different right. person each time and because it, that's alchemy and so where i have gone with alchemy versus where i came from alchemy i'm teaching now alchemy at what i consider a far higher level and because er, because consciousness is alchemy Mm. so how when i first started off as the alchemist it was definitely more on just the esoteric arts perception of alchemy and now it's evolved to everything is alchemy this entire reality what is this real what is it that um builds this reality that we live in what what is the fabric of our existence what is the nature of this game like what 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 builds our what builds this reality consciousness consciousness builds this reality and it we're in a specific dimension that if we were to be in another universe or another dimension we wouldn't even have the same laws for how we interact but this universe has as you may know the hermetic principles i do so in this specific universe we interact through those principles. I don't even know what's going on in another universe because I don't have the hardware for it. We come into this universe specifically with the hardware for this universe because we can't house the other information. That'd be too much to focus on. Much. This. Yeah. And so what builds this reality is consciousness, but a consciousness that's focused into a universe of light. And so a universe of light splits into the opposite of light, which is light and shadow. Mm -hmm. And so the basis of what's generating this universe is experiences that require and are of alchemy because alchemy is using that catalyst, the, that Light shadow. Dark. Yeah. To springboard. So everyone who can springboard off of their trials and tribulations or their, you know, darker points is an alchemist. But that's that's what builds this reality. It's the tension of those opposites. So are we meant to um, what are the word that comes through is duality. are we are we meant in this reality, this time space reality now to or I, maybe I'll just say being a human, is it about duality? and is it about the light and dark? is that is that fundamental to this experience as a human? Will that never go away? It won't go away in a human form, but we can evolve into a higher form of human. And in that, there will still be a dance. It won't be as crass. So there's always going to be that play of dark mm -hmm. and light when we're in a universe of dark and light. But the levels of crass don't always need to be there. And so we're, we're in a, a period of revelations where things aren't getting darker, but we're understanding what has been hidden far stronger now. And this is, is this how we then evolve by shedding light on the dark? Cause that feels like very much what's going on in the world. Like we're it's, I don't think it's worse than ever. I think we're just seeing more. So it's more in your face. It's like, it's obvious now. So is that how we transcend is to shine the light on the dark? Yeah. So whether people believe that we got a raw deal, we got tricked one, because a lot of my audience, you know, I speak to a wide audience. And it's funny because 
a lot of the times I'm speaking to people who I was fully in complete resonance with. So yeah, so sometimes we could look at it like we got a raw deal. We had terms and conditions coming into this reality that were not honored. I don't believe that, but that's a very strong viewpoint in the conscious community and in some spiritual circles. And then another way of looking at that is that we came into, we opted into maximum fragmentation. So earth at that point would be like a lot of the spiritual community talks about the new earth. Yeah. And that earth is a masterclass. We can look at it kind of like that. Like, did you want to sign up for like the haunted, haunted house? (laughs) (laughs) So it's like, yeah. Did you want this task list or this task list? Right. So it's like maximum fragmentation and going into that. That doesn't mean we have to stay in that experience. Uh, You know, there's an awakening happening, but the human condition as is, if we were to not evolve, is one of choice. We have more choice than any other density. We're in this place where our true nature, and this is going to sound very desolate, but I don't mean it in a desolate way. Our true nature is we're programmable. So we have an inclination, which we call humanity. Our humanity is towards empathy. That empathy, can be redirected like like we're given a certain set of conditions but at the end of the day only our free will will be able to really do something strong with them because we're placed with a bunch of different programs and influences so our true nature is one where yeah we have humanity but we're also super programmable and so to become fully aware of that we know that even our empathy can be programmed everything can be programmed. So that's why I teach so much about free will and discernment, because free will and discernment will allow a person to harness whatever their nature or their humanity is in a really exalted way Mm -hmm. and not in the programmable state. A lot of times I talk about two concepts and it'll be like the dark. Oh, but not that dark, this dark or the light. No, no, not that light, this light. And it's because Mm -hmm. there's different qualities within even the natures that we speak of. And so understanding will build more discernment. And the more we understand and the more we have discernment, we'll be able to get in touch with our true nature. And that's a that's beyond programming. So we have the lower nature, which is we're programmed. That's, hu- that's the human condition mm-hmm. is we're programmable. But the higher nature, the one that we, you know, the one that will take our free will to harness, but is completely accessible is the higher nature is discernment, which leads to evolution. You mentioned free will, and I have a lot of curiosity around free will versus determinism. Like, did we come in with a task and a mission? And is there is this predestined? Because I've done some, I've had some experiences, not a medicine at all. It was actually an EMDR, where I was like, wow, this is soul orchestration. I can see there's like an oversoul or a, um, an energies or guides that are literally like turning my head at the right time, giving me an experience. Like this is part of what I need to have happen to um, achieve what I came here to do. And then there's, you know, or is it just free will? Like what, how, or is it, is it a both? Is it an and or an or, or both? First, I'll say the reason why that's happening to you is because you're living in Dharma. What we want is to get everyone to live in Dharma. So that every <laughs> you know, so that's why I teach explain discernment. Dharma and explain yeah. Dharma because I I mean it's it's a powerful thing, but my, maybe not everyone knows. A Dharma is when somebody is living their purpose. Mm-hmm. So each of us have a nature. And if we're able to tap into that nature, fully understand it, and then use it in the highest capacity possible for that nature, that's Dharma. Mm. And in Dharma, it's a different, it's literally l- less cosmic laws govern dharma than the Hmm. lower levels so you have let's say baseline consciousness is one that in mysticism is called somnibalistic but let's just call it unconsciousness okay so if the baseline is unconsciousness there's more cosmic laws to govern them so you could look at it like a hypnotic state man is under stronger forces of sleep Mm -hmm. he has less free will So there's a stronger pull, a gravity towards sleep. The more a person starts to awaken, 
the more they hopefully are using that awakening to go, wait a second, I can access more of my free will. The more free will they access, they're not changing their nature, they're understanding their nature. And understanding their nature plus awakening equals accessing their dharmic path, their purpose, their, you know, what um, Campbell called bliss. Mm. Mm. So, so that realm is a different realm than what's called the general law or what I was talking about, uncon unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's why you're having those experiences. And then when people are, are in their dharma, they may possibly think that everyone <laughs> might be in their dharma. And so a, a large part of my purpose is I really would like to help harness people's discernment because that's what's going to allow them to access more free will, create more sovereignty, and maybe they might hop on their dharmic timeline. Explain how people can do that more. If somebody's like, yeah, I want to do that, what do they do? First and foremost, it really depends. And like, I don't like being linear at all, but it depends on how much capacity for truth a person can have. Because there's certain things that are subjective, and then there's certain things that are not subjective at all. Mm -hmm. And so just like how you were saying earlier, like, is this predetermined? That it's both. It's, you get random variables called chaos, and then you get ordered, which was predetermined. And then mm -hmm. you put them in a little bag, like two cats, and you watch them fight and see what happens. And so mm -hmm. there is always that randomness that comes out of that construction. So there's predestined mixed with what are you going to do next? And so between those two is how we live our life. And so how a person can harness enough of their free will to enter their dharma is by first understanding that those two are in harmony with one another. Mm -hmm. And we could look at it as the subjective and the objective. Mm -hmm. Having a higher capacity for the objective, meaning the objective truth of the world, is going to allow a person to locate themselves in like what's actually reality in this you know because i know that there's a lot of different ways that can be interpreted like like what do you mean by this reality but the consensus reality okay so understanding having a larger capacity for truth will allow a person to now go oh wait a second maybe that wasn't my purpose maybe this is my purpose so do you see how if we're not located in truth we might think our purpose is like oh man i'm supposed to go be an actor and acting's cool. I got nothing against acting. I wanted to be an actor. That's why I'm using this as an example. Mm -hmm. But if we're not located fully in truth, maybe that's not our purpose. Maybe that's not our joy. Maybe that's, and that could be someone's, and that could totally be someone's dharma. Mm -hmm. so one person's dharma might be acting and another person's dharma might not be acting at all. But a being won't know how to locate themselves and what their actual dharma is if they're not having a larger capacity for truth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yes, it does. And, you know, as soon as you said the word truth, I, it's something that I seek very deeply. I, I, no matter what the pain, I want to know the truth because I know that it's eventual. Um, I know that it will put me on my more accurate path. I know it will lead to more joy, more peace, more, more e evolution, more growth. Um, I think that's why I say yes to plant medicine. I say yes to, it's just, I'm, I'm ready for the truth. I want to know it no matter what. It's probably why I move fast in a lot of situations. Cause it's like, let's just cut to the chase here. Um, so I think it's worth like spending a minute unpacking what truth is. Truth is objective reality. We have subjective reality and objective reality. They're not in conflict. Now, I've come from, as we talked about earlier, mysticism, and in some sectors of mysticism, they worship objectivity to the point where I had to kind of like heal an accident aversion that I had to subjectivity just because of how much dominant objectivity is. So objectivity is considered truth. Now, there's subjective truths people have, and that's their personal experience. And then there's objective truth, meaning that what out of all the potential available energies, there was one thing that actually manifested. All the other ones we could call 
subjective potential available, but the thing that became what is, the thing out of all of those variants that went, no, it could be something simple. Like I opened a refrigerator door, I closed it. That is the truth of that action. Hmm. If now somebody comes along and says, she opened the refrigerator door, she put food in there and then she closed it. That's not the truth. <laughs> That's not what happened. That's not what is. So objectivity broken down to something so simple as that like refrigerator example is what is, hmm. what happened in the past and what hap is happening now. That's truth. How about an example of there's a car accident, there's four witnesses, they all give their report after seeing the accident of what happened, and all four have slightly different stories. Like I'm very curious about whether about objective realities and whether or not they exist, because we all have our own personal lens of how we see things. So I'm really curious what really creates an objective reality. Just like you walking across the river, you're not the same and the river's not the same. You can't, you, you can't do it twice the same way. You're not the same person. It's not the same experience. So really what creates an objective reality other than our perception? So to use that- Who's example, percepting? Who's percepting? So let's use your example of the accident where there were four people. Mm-hmm. The objective viewpoint would be the camera that was in the air that was had it below. The observer, yeah. the oversoul, the higher yes, self. Yes, yes. The, yeah, that would be the objective one. And that's not to say that that's battling people's sub or people's, you know, subjective reality. One of those people might have had a very accurate perception more than the other three people who were who were reported but that person let's call it the one out of the four who had the most accurate account could have been let's now use this as a metaphor for spirituality the one that was most in alignment with the oversoul yeah right less traumas less fra less less um less fractioning of their being because of things that had happened that made them see a situation different because of too much karma, too much, too many traumas that would distort the truth, which is the oversoul higher self objective reality. So it almost gets back to a little bit of like our, the very beginning when it's like, I'm trying to see if they're, uh, what they're projecting matches their frequency. It's like, how much truth is here? Like, can you be, a, can you hold how, how much, how much bullshit do you have? There's my coffee cup. I'm too magical for your bullshit. Like, <laughs> how much, how much bullshit is in the way of you being able to see more of that objective reality truth that the oversoul or higher self is seeing in that way? Exactly. So in this case scenario, it would be the person who is closest to the thing. So not all of the, even their reporting could have been equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, so it's subjective reality. I do not want to negate that at all because I came very much from schools of complete negation of anything emotional and subjective. So the subjectivity of our own personal experiences are contributing to the consensus reality. So they're not opposing forces, at least I don't perceive them as them. I view it as harmony and I view it at a higher level as the masculine and the feminine energies in a form of symbiosis. Whereas mm -hmm. with here, it gets translated into a lot of like conflict. Sure. Cause it's essentially the way I guess I'm seeing it is that the oversoul, it's like, it's you, it's still you. So it's just seeing things from a different perspective, which I totally want to ask about dimensions. So don't let me forget. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's working with you and in, in this guided process through this human experience, it's, it's sort of right there. And I feel like part of my work that I've been doing more deeply is getting more in touch with that intuitive side of me, the, the, the psychic intuitive, um, and, you know, just part of me that, 
is like the quiet voice underneath that is n- leading you through your life that most of the time and for most people never know is there. You're doing it. <laughs> trying to do it. Um, okay, let's talk about dimensions. I get very fascinated with this. And, and you know, can you explain them and what they are and how they play into our reality? And of course, you know, here we are trying to shift into a new reality of new earth 5D. So like, what's what's happening? Yeah, so the fifth dimensional consciousness is what needs to be embodied first. And for those of you that are wondering what happened to 4D, we're in 4D. We're already in 4D. Which so is? The fourth dimension is one that, well, in layman's terms, it's mathematical. Every time I talk about the fourth dimension, people go like, it's math and stuff. It's like, I know, but it's just sexier to call it the matrix. But the matrix is mathematical reconfigurations, and we're projected into that. So the third and the fourth, you can kind of just look like uh, that could even be like a really cool tool song, like the third and the fourth. <laughs> like that's just like <laughs> the third and the fourth are like the same. So the fifth dimension is a fifth dimensional consciousness of oneness, that enlightened state I was talking about. And now not the gnarly fragmented parts of that, but the overall symbiosis of us being the creator and the created, not in a creator way where we're putting ourselves, you know, um, above spirit. Um, There's this, even this dichotomy going on in consciousness, in, in the spiritual community, where I see people fighting a lot over like, we're the creator, or, or no, we're the created. And it's like, bro, like, 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 like calm down, like, Like when you're in fifth dimensional consciousness, you're in unity consciousness. So you don't have the ego of going like you don't have the subservient ego of I'm below and you don't have the, you know, um, the over the the superior ego of like I am I'm it. I'm everything. Mm. So because it's unity consciousness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's the integrated ego and the integrated ego understands that they're the ambassador of source. Mm. And so that fifth dimensional consciousness understands inherently just a part of that consciousness is to be out of separation consciousness and into unity consciousness. Because of that, it's heart centered, because how could you be in unity and still inflict pain? Yeah, because it's you. Exactly. Because that person that you are inflicting pain on is you. You couldn't do it. And that's why we really want certain experiences to happen to timelines here on Earth. And those really great experiences are utterly dependent on divine timing. And divine timing is not any date on a calendar. Divine timing is, hey, do you know that you're the other? (laughs) Because how in the celestial jungle, who wants to allow you out into the great wild if we don't have like the most grounded, like integrated, embodied perception? We're in a collective experience, and yet at the same time, the shamanism in me, (laughs) that we all have our own unique path too, you know, and and should we have certain goals, and we are not coming from a place of resistance, we can have our own separate path. And that maybe not might not even entail, like, oh, we're all going to the same place. Hmm. So what I talk about in my channel is, you know, everyone's on the same party bus. But I completely am aware of, and I just don't talk about the fact that there are certain people who have taken their chakras out because they're going someplace else. I have nothing against that. The, the, nobody I know who's not taking their chakras out is, you know, a, a neophyte. They're not a newbie. They This isn't their first rodeo. They know what they're doing. So for me, I'm about the collective experience. And so I call that ascension. Ascension is when we're all, you know, going to the same place on the party bus. But we are, we are, we're all going to the same place. Well, everyone who who agrees to that. But that's why I made such a, that's why I really illustrated a difference. Because when you ask what the next step is, I want to definitely honor a person's individual free will and unique life path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this where the 3D, 5D new earth split comes in, where people just choose to stay in a different reality? It's an unconscious choice. So one could say 
is it a choice? But yeah. <laughs> right. Cause it's not conscious. So it's like, it's but they're default. stuck. And so then I would tell me that they're also not something about it. They're not willing to see truth either. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's where the timeline split comes. Some people, um, I know in hermeticism mm -hmm. strongly believe that it does not work that way. I don't lose sleep. It's mm -hmm. fine. Other people can have different points of view. However, how I see it is it's absolutely like a hundred percent, a timeline split. Uh, I don't want that to be, I like all beings to be free. I like them all to not be in the state of unconsciousness, but mm -hmm. I also at the same time understand that that's, you know, enormously codependent of me. <laughs> okay. like, we can be codependent together. I got a little bit of that in me. Yeah. So I got the savior complex, just like all the rest of us. But I, I, I'm all, I also know that, you know, people are not all prepared. They're not all at, operating at the same level of accessing their soul's essence, their higher self's essence. And they've got their own journey with their mm -hmm. own grooves in it energetically. Will they just be coming back again to? They won't be even be coming human? back to Earth. Okay, yeah. so no, because Earth is, is going... ascending. So they're gonna go. Um, to, I, I don't even know. It could be some other, yeah, planet. Well, they'll just become some other extraterrestrial of a lower consciousness of a third dimensional consciousness in some other galaxy of reality and with a reality with that reality. Yeah, and that's why we see a lot of our guides come through as like not well formed entities mm. and we can even accidentally like praise them or revere them as being like oh whoa because you know because you're like alien and it's like a lot of them came from failed timelines a Sh lot of them came from yo don't go down that path i'm here to warn you from the future we went down the wrong path and i know we could get subjective and say, you know, philosophically, there is no such thing as wrong. And I would agree. I would absolutely agree that all of it adds to the experiment. So there's no such thing technically as failed. However, the objective truth within that is also, yeah, there's such a thing as having degraded pathways and higher pathways. How does entropy pay into, play into all this? Because essentially the universe is in a path of in in a in a, in a time is basically entropy is what yeah how did the universe get created and is this some sort of form of entropy and how does that how does that affect us entropy is the force so it's not like oh it's entropy like like entropy is the means that the universe uses but it's like, going getting a, going away from us like essentially it's going away from us into yeah. a, into less and less organization less order mm -hmm. Unless you become the alchemist, you can harness that same entropy. You can harness it. But yes, for the sake of occultism, to stay not on my, my higher plane of existence now, but um, in classical esoteric terminology, entropy is definitely the force of chaos and not in the great way. It's leading towards involution, which is the opposite of evolution, mm -hmm. meaning that that expansion isn't like the positive type of expansion. It's the expansion of fragmentation so much fragmentation and mm -hmm. so how you were saying earlier about the two different timelines you could look at it as a split going on where one path is of entropy and the other path is of syntropy what but part that's of alchemy mm, that alchemy is always to separate and recombine separate and recombine so i would like alchemy to all happen right here as i'm watching it but i know that i'm a part of a separation and a combination because it's always refining so by the time you're done separating and combine, combining back and forth, something has become so refined. And that refinement process loses a lot of the um, other, the, the heavier layers of it. So those heavier layers of the process of separating the impurities from whatever is left, whatever is fit enough, we could look at it, fit enough to survive, mm -hmm. would be that um that excess that's being shedded off through that cellular process of the timeline split what part of me is in a timeline in another timeline what part of me splits like what is that i i guess i i'm i only have my own level of consciousness so i i'm trying to visualize and oh your I ego comprehend 
how this happens. So when a timeline splits and there's me that goes off into, I'm assuming me that splits off into one trajectory of, of a reality, of a timeline, of entropy perhaps, then what is that? What, what, what is the me? I guess, let me expand, extend a little bit further. When I was on that hero's dose of psilocybin, baseline reality was in, it was a waveform. I was just like a stream. And so I'm wondering like, does my stream split? What happens when there's a timeline split? Your build up to that was way funner than my response is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Because- because the the separating and the recombining in this case, when we're talking about a large timeline split, like ascension based timeline split, is one where the people headed towards syntropy or unity consciousness, such as yourself in that example, will be splitting and recombining their own psyche. So what is the shedding or the die off would be um, levels of illusion of ego, but someone else's would be shedding and fragmenting into entropy one part of me is heading towards more order where someone else might be just splitting off to two two pathways of entropy four ten how much sure. cognitive dissonance can a person hold if a woodchuck could chuck wood i it's it's consolidating our cognitive dissonance now once you clean up all of your dissonance you won't exist so this isn't about I know. I know. That's what I saw. (laughs) That's what I saw. I saw, I literally was in that waveform and I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to be human again. I don't know. Cause I know it's not real. Yeah, exactly. So that's the level of integration. You're like riding the waves and, you know, timelines and the splitting and the recombining. So you're, you're on your dharmic alchemical journey. (laughs) Um, when it comes to that same process of splitting and recombining, going in the level, going in the opposite direction, the direction of unconsciousness, we're talking about maximum fragmentation. That can look like that could look like severe levels of cognitive dissonance. Severe cognitive dissonance. Like a person might agree with you. And then as soon as somebody comes in the room, They'll switch into a new character in their head. And they're not like trying to do any of this. But let's say you're talking about something and it's a little woo or it's a little far out there. And then someone else comes into the room. This person can completely switch into a different train track in their head, which is what the cognitive dissonance is. And this new character or this new persona within them, completely real, they're not making any of this up, doesn't agree with you at all. They could even be scoffing or they could even, you know, like, be where once there was a little bit of harmony, now there's like complete conflict. And this happens all of the time when it comes to the cognitive dissonance getting more and more severe, because that's what unconsciousness does. Unconsciousness doesn't know that the left hand is a part of the right hand. They don't even, they're not even aware that they're appendages on an entity. Mm. That's Mm. how severe the cognitive dissonance can become. Mm. When you say that, it makes me in conflict and cognitive dissonance and, and, that whole mess, it makes me wonder what relationships are for. What are like intimate relationships for? Because those seem like they bring out the most amount of trauma, the most amount of disagreement, the most amount of challenge, emotion. What is that? What is that for in this reality? Yeah, for evolution. And I would add, this is my own two cents. Um, God doesn't want to be lonely. (laughs) <laughs> I doesn't want to be lonely. I tapped into that. I know firsthand experience. I was terrified of the fact that it had awoken to its own existence. And to be in relation with something is an enormously, um, not buffered, but it's an a, enormously connected state versus the loneliness and the feeling of abandonment or desolate that comes from not being in relation. I wrote a poem about this. Did you? (laughs) Yeah, I I wrote a whole poetry book after that. (laughs) Is that why in a a relationship, I'm using myself as an example, I've never 
actually felt really lonely alone. I've only actually felt lonely in a relationship. And I wonder if it's because the rejection of the unity, like rejection of self, essentially, since we're all from the same, like, is that God not accepting itself, essentially, like, that is like the most traumatic sort of um, situation to be in. It's worse than being alone, because it's actually rejection. Or rejecting a part of someone. I wouldn't say necessarily that feeling lonely in a relationship is God rejecting itself. I'd say that that's God um, being too scared to go find another reflection that accurately reflects God clearer. So are relationships needed in this? Oh, absolutely. Because re relationships are mirrors. So relationship, it'd be really hard to not desire a relationship because what you're desiring is evolution. Right. Yeah. So, okay. So let's put into, the, so there's a situation, a conflict comes up, you and your partner, what do you do then? How do you move through that? Yeah. You move through a conflict through intimacy, which means that you tell your partner where your part of the conflict is with this. They tell you what their part of the conflict is with that. Mm -hmm. And then you try to see if there can be resolution from those two sides of the conflict. Mm -hmm. And so having that ability to be heard and to be seen, being seen is our deepest wound. Not being seen is our deepest wound as a species. Yeah, It's the narcissistic wounding. So we weren't seen. And then we started from that ground point. It went like, look, you're not seen. Okay, go. And then you go through life. And then everyone has their own special unique journey based off of that. They were not seen properly. And so even if you had a great life, this isn't, this isn't dis discriminated against anyone's life. So being seen is that way with the intimacy that you navigate conflict. And so if that can't happen, like in an example where there's just loneliness, that would already mean that the conditions were that you weren't feeling that you were truly seen hmm. because that's the core human wound. So that tends to be where a lot that of our lonely. disharmony, lonely frustration comes is actually an aspect of us that doesn't feel seen. Correct. 1000%. Hmm. How do we like, did everyone have people who went like, oh, my God, you're like so special. You're like, 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 no, we you, everyone had things projected onto them, hopes and fears. What is it that's perhaps, you know, the most occult information that would help humanity evolve into more of a more unity consciousness and 5D reality? I'm going to be responsible here. I'm going to speak on behalf of my oversoul. <laughs> If you were irresponsible, that's okay too. <laughs> the universe really wants us to understand natural law. And natural law is pretty basic. It's the most occult information. And what I mean by that is all occult traditions had this as their end all be all, meaning they started with this and you ended with this. It's even known that there's nothing new under the sun. And when a person is talking about that, like, what do you mean there's nothing new under the sun? What that's referring to in occult terminology is natural law, meaning, hey, guess what's not going to change in this universe, at least with our hardware in this universe, natural law is not going to change. And so since your question was the most occult information I could give for evolution, it would be that natural law is completely binding, meaning that regardless of whether we're aware of it or not, it's at work. So even if we're not aware of it, it's still applying to us. And what that is, is, is that there's the non-aggression principle, but also the principle of force, meaning that don't start nothing, don't violate anybody. But if somebody violates you, you have to do something. <laughs> you, have, you have to protect someone or yourself. You have to use force. You didn't want to, but it came to you. But unless you're being violated or a person's being viola violated, if you don't have to use force, there's the non-aggression principle, which is 
to do not violate another being. And if I had to sum up evolution in a nutshell, which is, you know, like not very mystical, but believe it or not, this is like, I'm not kidding. This is the most dense, nutrient dense occult information one could give. This is like right there with the quadrivium. And so what humanity needs to understand is, is that we're also complicit for our non-action at a micro mm -hmm. level and at a macro level, meaning that how the universe is gauging how fit we are as a species, how responsible we are. And there's severe consequences if we don't meet this criteria is, hey, do you take conscious actions? Because what I just described was conscious action. Conscious action for oneself and conscious action to make sure that a person isn't violating another being. And if we don't meet that bare minimum criteria for being able to understand natural law and to live by natural law, how are we a fit species? How are like you, mm. even if a being didn't want to become enlightened, if you lived by that standard, you would become highly enlightened on accident. Mm. Because that's kind of like, that's the gauge. That's like the litmus test where everything after that is like, okay, they're fit. Okay. They, you know, like we can, you know, they have, have what it takes. Like yeah. if you protect yourself and you protect someone else that needs protection, then that qualifies as a high level of fitness to be, to sustain as a species. Yes. So that, and we could just spread this out to, you know, really broad levels. We could look at something where if we're not immediately at that scene of injury, if we're able to understand objective reality to the best of our ability, we can be the better observer in that, you know, car scene accident. Yeah. By yeah. doing so, we can take conscious actions, meaning that if we just sit there and we don't give our report, that we are actually from the, from the universe's standards, not mine. The universe says you're 100% complicit. You might as well have done the evil action. Huh. And it's not you because the universe. Have. Yeah. It's not because the universe doesn't understand proximity huh. or it doesn't understand, you know, gray zones. It's because that's not a fit being. It's not an enlightened being. What does this mean for, let's say, activism or a platform? Are you, do you have to use it or do you have to be part of activism or movements or, you know, your level of consciousness of truth? Like, do you have to promote that if you can? Because one person's dharma will be different from another person's. So they don't have to do ground roots activism. A lot of the ground roots activism is 100% controlled opposition. <laughs> so it's not about, you know... I think activism serves a very important purpose for our healing journey. It's kind of mm -hmm. like where we practice, wh where we get to exercise our catharsis, mm -hmm. where we get to take back our power. Mm -hmm. But even that level of the playing field of consciousness is not the end all be all. So it's activism, but a spiritual activism at wherever that person's capacity of consciousness is. So at one point in time, I was, um, like a regional coordinator, I was a volunteer to go get people's signatures for against human trafficking in California. That was at my time, my consciousness believed in the system and, you know, and that was my duty. That was my dharma. Mm -hmm. But as a being continues to evolve, continues to awaken, whatever that nature is. So everyone's nature won't look the same. Mm. somebody's activism will look different. And so it's our job now to recognize our differences rather than judge somebody's activism. Okay. Cause I, I get stuck in this sort of like little bit of a mental argument w about which I have my perspective, which is I try, I really don't like to play into movements or drama or politics. I just don't like, I'd rather, I think sometimes the more you talk about like identity politics, the more you talk about being different and the more you talk about the problems that you want fixed, the more you're talking about the problems. And so for me, it feels more in alignment to just live the way I want to live and 
talk about things that are moving in a positive fashion and things that are more optimistic than negative and sort of disagreements more about like this conversation, how do we live? Like, what are the rules? I just want to know. So is that acceptable within the laws, law of the universe to have to act if you see, like, am I, am I in violation in any way by not using my voice to talk about X, Y, Z, because I can? The first level of reality you were addressing is far different from universal laws level of reality. So the first level of reality that you're addressing about the system, whatever they're talking about with peace and love, it doesn't matter. I agree. They're in cognitive dissonance. They're in complete, utter entropy, cognitive dissonance. I agree. So what so your activism would be the life you're living, mm -hmm. but then also you I mean you have a large platform where you're allowing people to expand their consciousness and then reconfigure it and then expand their consciousness. So you're leading people to sovereignty, which is a thousand percent what universal law wants. Universal law is universal law is about a being being in their sovereignty. When a being is in their sovereignty, maybe they'll agree with you, maybe they won't, but it's coming from their own awakened state, not the unconscious program state, you know, back to the two natures. Mm -hmm. But they have that they have that unique subjective reality of agreeing or disagreeing, but we all operate under natural law under one objective reality, which is, yeah, we might agree or disagree, but we're not going to harm each other. We're not going to violate each other. And if that does happen, we do something. We take conscious action. So you have, once again, the objective reality in this universal law, higher level of living, knowing that also at the same time, there's the fact that as a sovereign being, you're not always going to agree. Yeah, because you're not at the same place. Yeah. So you're doing high level spiritual activism. Mm. I have like a jillion questions. I think this is like episode one of a, of, of many for us, but um, I think that's good for today. I think that's a lot of great information and a lot of activation as planting seeds is really what I like to do with the show. Um, you know, sometimes the first time people hear things, they're like, what? But then the second time they hear them, they're like, hmm. So if it's the first time, I'm excited for that because it's part of the process. So thank absolutely. You. I had so much fun. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Like, I just am super grateful. I just love your content. And, um, you know, I just so deeply appreciate and gravitate towards people that are able to articulate things in such a clear way, the way you are. And there's a saying, it's if you don't understand, I'm not going to, it's paraphrasing basically that if you don't understand something well enough, you can't explain it simply. And you just really understand things quite simply for how complicated and deep they are. So thank you. Thank you for living in your Dharma. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.